are some of the simplest mathematical objects that one can write down. And yet, at the same time, they're at the heart of some of the deepest problems in all of mathematics. In high school, one learns about polynomials, normally just studying of the form, say, y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. The Pythagorean theorem can be seen as a polynomial in three variables, as, as being described by a polynomial in three variables. Uh, there is, of course, the famous example of Fermat's last theorem. And there are things, say, for example, like elliptic curves, which There are also, for example, things like elliptic curves, some of which have a form such as this, and of course are important at important objects to study in the intersection of number theory and geometry. So there's a rich tapestry of polynomials out there, and at least classical algebraic geometry is a framework for understanding, in some sense, um, polynomial equations. But of course, as we're going to see, uh, it's so much deeper uh, than just that surface level uh, tagline, if you will. <clears throat> but at least with the motivation in mind that polynomials are a, a thing of interest to study, Let's consider then that we have some polynomial uh, f of, and let's give it just some number of variables, say x1 up to xn. Now there's two spaces we want to consider with respect to this polynomial. So one is we're going to think about the space in which this polynomial lives. In particular, uh, we're going to consider polynomials that are defined over fields. Of course, this can be done over uh, rings as well, but the sort of baseline theory is to consider polynomials over fields. So we're going to get let uh, f be a function or polynomial in n variables, which is in the ring of polynomials with uh, coefficients in some field k. So this is sort of, this is the collection of, of objects that the polynomial itself belongs to. And this is the algebraic side of the story. Uh, but then we also want to consider that the polynomial, we want to think about the geometric space in which it lives. So since the polynomial is able to handle n different variables, we really want to think about this polynomial as carving out uh, geometric objects in the space A sub k n. Now all this is is really just fancy notation to talk about ordered n tuples of elements of our field, right? Because our polynomial is uh, defined with coefficients in a certain field, so definitely we want to plug uh, points. Definitely we want to plug points into our polynomial which belong to that field. Now you may wonder, well, why don't I just write this as k to the n and consider the k tuple of the field? Uh, the reason we use this difference in notation is because often when we're thinking about k to the n, well, we're thinking about the vector space. We're thinking about the n-dimensional vector space that's defined over that field. However, in this case, uh, zero doesn't play an important role necessarily in the way that it does in the theory of vector spaces. So one reason why we use this fancy A with a K and N notation is simply to differentiate uh, 
uh, between those different worlds and to highlight that zero is not the significant player that it is in the theory of vector spaces. So we call this affine n space, and maybe I should write that out, hence the A. And what we're often interested in is finding the zeros of a polynomial. Now, of course, some polynomials, say I were to have an elliptic curve, which looks like some uh, y squared equal to some qu uh, cubic in x, and you know, for example, and a big, a large field of study is finding rational solutions to these elliptic curves. Well, I can simply move everything to one side of the equation, and now this is just a polynomial in two variables, and we're interested in the solutions which make it equal to zero, in particular the rational solutions which make it equal to zero. So towards that end, we may as well develop some notation for talking about this in a concise way. So affine in our affine n space, we're going to define these sets z of f. These are going to be the points of affine n space, which our polynomial vanishes on. And similarly, suppose I want to consider more than one polynomial at a time. So suppose I have some subset T of my ring. So uh, as a shorthand, why don't we write our polynomial ring, that is the polynomials with coefficients in the field K. Let's just write that as A. <clears throat> Say I've got uh, some subset of our ring A then I'm going to define z of t to be the set of points which makes the polynomials vanish. But in this case, we're going to consider we want to do it for all polynomials simultaneously. So if there is no common zeros for two polynomials in T, then this set's actually going to be empty. And if this is the case, so if we have some subset of affine n space, and it happens to be equal to some z of t, then we're going to call this set algebraic. Algebraic! So it turns out that these sets actually define closed sets of a topology on this space. So if we def take the set tau to be the collection of algebraic sets, then my claim is that this is a topology. Well, we know that there's a zero polynomial in our polynomial ring, and Clearly, the zero polynomial, well, its zero set is the entire space. It's always zero. It's constantly zero. So it doesn't matter what point you evaluate it at. So the entire space is definitely in our topology. Uh, and similarly, if, well, we know we have a multiplicative identity, one, in our ring, uh, 
being the multiplicative identity of the field. And this is also a constant, and it's never zero. So we also know that the empty set is a part of our topology as well. Now, remember for, uh, for closed sets, we want to check that uh, they're closed under finite unions. Uh, and by the principle of mathematical induction, it's simple enough to uh, sim just consider the case when uh, we have two closed sets. And if we can establish it for two closed sets, then we can establish it for any finite number of closed sets. So if we're given some S and T, which are subsets of our ring A, uh, let's define the set S times T to be the collection of all f times g, where f belongs to s, and g belongs to t. Let's consider when I have a point that's in uh, the union of the algebraic sets zs and zt. Well, in this case, for any f in s, and some g in t. We know that since it's in one of these sets, it must make either f or g vanish. So therefore, f evaluated at p and multiplied by g evaluated at p, well, that's got to be equal to zero. But notice that this is just the polynomial f times g evaluated at p. And that means in particular that p is in the algebraic set defined by the zeros of our set s times t. Conversely, uh, let's suppose that we were to start off with a point in this algebraic set. And let's say, let's see what happens if p weren't in the algebraic set z of s. Well, since p is in the algebraic set of z s t, we know that given some g in our set t, uh, it's the case that for uh, every f in s, we must have that f times g at p is equal to zero. In other words, that f times p times g at p uh, is equal to zero. But remember that we're assuming that p is not in the algebraic set z of s. So that means for one of these f's, it has to be, uh, f at p has to be non-zero, because it can't be a simultaneous zero for all of them. But if that's the case, remember, we're working with a field here. We're evaluating things in a field, and so we don't have any zero divisors. And so that means that the only way that this can be zero is if g evaluated at p is zero. But we picked g arbitrarily. So that means that this point p actually has to make every element of t vanish. In other words, this tells us that p is in the algebraic set z of t. So in other words, it's in this union. But that tells us then that the algebraic set, the union of the algebraic sets, uh, Zs and Zt, this is itself an algebraic set. And so we find that this actually is uh, the union of two closed sets is a closed set. So all that remains to do is to check that arbitrary intersections of closed sets remain closed.
So suppose P was in some intersection, uh, let's say some over some indexing set I of closed sets Z, T. Well, what does this mean? This means that uh, P is in every single one of these uh, individual sets of this intersection. In particular, it makes uh, everything, every polynomial in T sub i vanish. But if it does this for every T sub i, then really that's saying that P is in the algebraic set, which is the union, the zeros, the zero locus, as uh, it's sometimes called. something I maybe should have mentioned a bit earlier, uh, the zero locus uh, of these polynomials. Conversely, if we had a point P, which was in this union, well, that means P has to make every polynomial in this union vanish. In particular, it makes every polynomial in T sub i vanish for every i. So, in other words, P is in Z of T sub i for all i and i. Well, that's just saying that P is in fact in the intersection of all these Z of t sub i. So in other words, we've written this arbitrary intersection of closed sets as a closed set. And that concludes the proof. We've now seen that the three axioms for closed sets of a topology are satisfied. So this topology is called the Zariski topology. And this is the inspiration uh, for the definition cor corresponding in scheme theory, which we'll see eventually. So next time, we're going to get into perhaps the real reason why this is called algebraic geometry, and we're going to start talking about this wonderful dictionary that exists uh, between our two spaces, that is the space where our polynomial carves out a geometric object, and the ring in which the polynomial lives. And it turns out there's a really nice identification between structures uh, of these two different structures.